He has uh, occupied uh, some of the most important functions in the uh, Turkish uh, government. He was uh, vice uh, prime minister, minister of finance, minister of foreign affairs, and what else, Ali? That's all? European Union Affairs. And European Union Affairs. So he has an extraordinary experience, and I can tell you, I think I have had the, uh, one of those who had the privilege of uh, uh, having known him for uh, something like 10 years, or perhaps even more now, uh, he's uh, highly uh, respected uh, worldwide, and uh, in particular in the United States and uh, in uh, the European Union. So it's uh, a great uh, privilege, uh, Ali, to have you here, and it was also, I must repeat, a great privi privilege to have former Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ahmed Avutulu, again, sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, we can go a little bit uh, deeper this afternoon uh, to uh, understand what is going on in Turkey now and uh, the future of uh, the relations between Turkey and uh, uh, particularly the, 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 the West, uh, the United States and, uh, and Europe. So, Ali, if you allow me, I think we could start with um, a very simple question, probably not a simple answer, but a simple question. Can you uh, enlighten us a little bit more about what is going on in Turkey? Uh, how should we understand uh, what happened uh, with the failed coup uh, last uh, July? Uh, what, is, uh, what are exactly the stakes of the Gulen uh, sect uh, that uh, very few people uh, know and understand uh, in, in the West? Uh, what about uh, the uh, request of President Erdogan of uh, extradition of uh, Mr. Fethullah Gulen? I think perhaps uh, we could start uh, with uh, some uh, clarification on this uh, fundamental domestic uh, issue, and then we will uh, widen the discussion to some uh, foreign uh, policy issues. So uh, the first question is put, and we are listening to you very uh, carefully indeed. Uh, well, Thierry, thank you very much, first of all, for your invitation, and also I have to express my sincere appreciation for the uh, State of Qatar and Foreign Minister of Qatar for organizing this event together with IFRI, which is a very important uh, institute for global uh, affairs, for international relations, which has been uh, in the international uh, community as a big success story, I have to say, and congregations on doing the World Policy Forum. Uh, in a very consistent and successful way. Actually, I was able to attend the Monaco event, uh, which was three or four years ago, uh, I remember, uh, and congratulations on, on doing this this time here in Doha, Qatar. Uh, well, what Turkey has gone through this summer, uh, in July, uh, was quite traumatic, uh, unexpected, quite uh, abrupt. Uh, we were faced with a coup attempt it was not f the full military attempting this, but it was a faction within our military tied to Fethullah Gülen, uh, those Gülenists, uh, I would say, who were within our army attempted this, uh, but it was unsuccessful, it failed. I think it was very important for uh, our president Erdogan to make a call for the people to occupy the streets, to occupy the squares of the country, and people responded very fast. Uh, and the strong stance of Turkish people, uh, in a way, prevented the uh, coup, which could get really worse. But when we analyze this, why uh, this happened, or who are uh, Gülenists, or who is Fethullah Gülen, this actually uh, dates back to more than 40 years ago. Uh, a, a, a religious gathering, I would say, which we thought, on the visible side, 
was doing good things like schools and charity, social work, uh, solidarity, social solidarity work and so forth, uh, not only in Turkey but around the world, we actually cooperated with them for some time uh, and helped them uh, do more of the things which we thought were good things. And they infiltrated step by step to state organizations. So the, the followers of Fethullah Gülen uh, got more and more into our uh, government units, our judicial system, our police force, army. Uh, and after reaching a certain threshold of uh, occupancy or uh, effect, I would say, then they started to exercise this power for the organization itself. In a way, just uh, capturing the control of the state became more and more of an important agenda for them. And we were kind of careful about what they were doing, especially over the last few years, but we didn't really think that they could go that far to attempt a, a coup. Uh, we lost 241 people, mostly civilians, that night. More than 2,000 people wounded. Uh, they hit the parliament building by F-16 aircrafts. They used Skorsk helicopters, tanks to bomb the presidential palace, our s intelligence headquarters, our police force headquarters. And think about any capital in the world, whether it is London or Washington or Paris, in one night, you, the, the, some elements of your own army uh, using the most modern weapons, hitting the most critical state units. So that was quite a trauma for us. And after the 15th of, uh, of July, uh, we uh, started a very important process. It's a massive operation of the police force and the our judicial system nowadays, flying, trying to uh, pick the people who are involved uh, with this organization. And now we call them FETO, a terrorist organization, since they even used weapons to destabilize the country. Uh, so, so we are now going through a big, big effort to make sure that the followers of uh, Gülen or members of this terrorist organization are no longer in critical positions in the government system. But the thing is they can hide themselves very well. It's a very secretive organization. And the problem with this organization, like some other terrorist organizations in, in the uh, Islamic world, is that the, in the mainstream Islam, mainstream Islamic thinking, our target has to be legitimate, religiously legitimate, and every step that we take towards that target has to be also legitimate, religiously legitimate. Uh, but FETO and some other terrorist organizations in the Islamic world, unfortunately, if they have a legitimate target, they can do every kind of nasty things, all kinds of religiously illegal things to reach that target. I, said, I think it's a big sickness that the Muslim world has to deal with, and, and Islamic thinkers has to work on very, very uh, carefully. Another important element with this organization is that they think that their leader is like Messiah or the awaited one. So when they get an order, the followers turn into robots or zombies, so they don't even think. Uh, actually, in Islam, thinking and our mind using our brains is a big gift which differentiates us from all the other being creatures. Uh, so so in, in these kind of organizations, the followers are asked to stop thinking, close their minds, lock their minds, and do every kind of crazy thing. So this is also a sickness that's also a big flow that we have to deal with. Uh, and this is not just for FETO, I think for, for Daesh, for Al-Qaeda, or other uh, organizations. Th this is uh, something which needs a, a serious uh, dealing with. So uh, what we are going through is not easy because on one hand Turkey signed up to all the important values and ideals uh, like democracy, human rights, freedoms, rule of law and uh, since 2002 from the very beginning of uh, AK Party we were very careful to improve ourselves on these areas together with improving our domestic security situation and being more careful about of course our external security situation also. So we didn't want to really make a trade-off between security and freedoms and so forth so far. But this is such a unique event that like France did after the Paris bombings, we had to uh, declare an emergency rule in the country. And under the emergency rule, uh, the mood is of course security first. And when this, there is a security first uh, approach, then there are uh, some, some probably criticism coming from and there. But uh, the number one priority right now in Turkey is to restrengthen the stability, 
making sure that our domestic security situation uh, gets back to normal because not only our domestic security situation is important, but on our Syrian border, we have two important terror organizations right across the border, Daesh and uh, YPG, PYD, or PKK, as we call them in, in Turkey, which, is, which are right on our border. And, and Syria is a huge regional threat uh, for, for uh, many countries, not only for Turkey. So on one hand, we are dealing with this domestic issue, and on the other hand, we are also dealing with Syria and also how things will evolve in Iraq as well as in Yemen and Libya and so, so it's not easy times in this part of the world, but this part of the world is also uh, the, the, the region of Europe and uh, we hope that uh, our, our European colleagues and friends uh, have more input and support in the solution of some of these uh, issues, which I, that's why also I think having this WPC here in Doha has a very special meaning. Thank you very much. To make the transition with uh, foreign uh, policy issues, the fact is that in terms of perception, uh, Turkey is, and President Erdogan are uh, perceived very often as, as having overreacted uh, with uh, tens of thousands of people displaced, arrested, etc., etc. And the uh, result is that there is a sense of crisis uh, in the relationship with uh, Europe, with the European uh, Union. We will see that in the next few days, maybe. Um, there are uh, talks about uh, uh, restoring the death penalty, in which case that would be incompatible with the belonging of Turkey uh, to the Council of Europe, which is, uh, uh, of which uh, Turkey uh, was a founding father, that very few people uh, maybe uh, know that. So uh, it's a relatively difficult situation. And of course, with the US, uh, there is the question of uh, what uh, President Trump, President-elect Trump, will do. Will he uh, abide by the request of uh, extraditing uh, uh, Gulen? Uh, it, it, I, I'm not even sure that he has the power to do it himself, by the way, that there is a legal uh, problem here. But be that it may be, be as it may, the, there is a, uh, th th there could be some serious, I say there could be because some uh, serious diplomatic problems both with the EU and, uh, and with the US and at the same time the relationship between Turkey and the West is becoming more and more important. In the case of Europe we have the refugee issue, uh, we have the Middle East uh, situation. So uh, how do you see the uh, interaction between these uh, domestic uh, problems uh, in Turkey and this uh, quite complicated international situation, particularly uh, in, in, with the West? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, the world is going through a deglobalization process nowadays. So many countries looking more and more just inward, uh, being disintegrated from each other, the world trade, the global trade, used to increase double the size of the global growth, but now the world trade is increasing uh, at par or even less than the growth of the global economy. So in a way, countries or regions are becoming more and more com compartmentalized, uh, and, and populism is on the rise. Nationalism, as our uh, Prime Minister Davutoglu already mentioned in the opening session, uh, so so this, this is populism, nationalism, and in every country, blaming outsiders for whatever is going wrong in the country is a big, big problem. So the, the, the big turmoil that the Middle East is going through, unfortunately, coincides with such a deglobalization process that the world is, is going through. Uh, even when we look at the, uh, at the European Union, the 2008-2009 crisis, the Eurozone uh, crisis made so many countries inevitably too much occupied with their domestic issues that the enough attention in Middle East and North Africa probably was not paid. And when the Arab Spring started, uh, as Turkey, we felt quite lonely in a way, defending and uh, expressing the very European values to our Middle East and uh, North, North African uh, neighbors. Uh, but transformation in, in this part of the world is 
uh, not, not easy. Like in Eastern Europe, when uh, the transformation happened after the Soviet Union, many countries became part of EU, become, became part of NATO, but a huge political and economic support has been given to those countries, and they were promised a better welfare, they were promised uh, better circumstances for their citizens. Poland today gets grants of about 3 to 4 percent of GDP from the EU, and Poland is quite an advanced economy nowadays, but they still get a grant from the EU to continue with the transformation. Uh, so uh, for Middle East and North Africa, that was uh, not unfortunately given. Another problem, I think, is the deficit of leadership in the world. Uh, that, is, uh, that has played a key role in the deterioration of the uh, process, and, and the, the nationalism and populism is also a result of uh, lack of leadership in quite a few countries. In Turkey, luckily, we don't have that problem. So we have a very strong leadership, and this strong uh, leadership has been quite influential in transforming the countries uh, since, uh, since 2002. Uh, but also, I think it's important to understand the, the, the domestic and regional circumstances of, of uh, Turkey and why you mentioned like uh, civil servants being laid off from government units and so forth. But in these difficult times, sometimes it becomes necessary like what happened in Eastern Germany when the Eastern and Western Germany was, were being reunified. Hundreds of thousands of civil servants were laid off uh, in order to clear the Nazi mentality from the state system. So in terms of our domestic security situation right now, FETÖ and PKK, two biggest threats, and sometimes to make sure that those threats really go away, uh, you have to do these uh, kind of things. As I said, our mood right now is security first mood. Uh, but, but this will, this will uh, change, and, and uh, we hope that the European uh, Union also goes back to the founding values, uh, and I think the world does need a, European, a strong European Union, in my view, uh, especially after the Second World War, the European Union emerged as a very important peace project. Uh, countries fighting with each other, uh, million after millions, of, millions and millions of people died, they were able to find some common uh, areas of interest, some common interests which they can build on. It started with coal and steel, very simple subjects maybe. Uh, then it turned into a, an economic entity, uh, common market, and then European economic community, then European community, final European Union. So common economic interests uh, were at the very fundamentals of European Union uh, emerging as a very important success story. And now I'm afraid we are losing it because the feeling of uh, when we are together, we benefit all. This feeling is now evaporating in many European Union member states, like what happened in the Brexit vote. Uh, the 52% uh, of the British people thought that being together with the EU does no longer help UK, actually being a member of the EU is a cost, not a benefit, so why don't we get out? So if this feeling of uh, not any longer uh, having the common benefits of being together uh, is, 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 is not good. So, so this is a very dangerous uh, trend that we are uh, observing. As Turkey, it's a very big pity for us because we had a strong EU anchor, external anchor, which helped us a lot to transform ourselves in, in, in rule of law, in human rights, freedoms, in how our democracy functions. And now that important external anchor or a big target is also evaporating in front of our eyes as a very important uh, magnet. And the, the soft power of the EU, the leverage of the EU on the neighborhood is also evaporating with, uh, together with the deteriorating solidarity within the EU. Uh, so. It is not easy times in our, in our, uh, in our region and also within uh, Turkey. Uh, but I think uh, we, this is not also a missed opportunity. We still have to be uh, hopeful. We have to work a lot. There are, I think, still a lot of, lot of people in this region and around the world uh, who are good global thinkers and what kind of a better region and better world that we can, uh, we can achieve. Uh, and, and we have to move, move, move forward. Well, thank you, Ali. So what I will do now is we have about uh, 10 minutes 
uh, I would like to take this uh, the opportunity of uh, having Ali Babajan with us here to take a few questions. And I will ask uh, you to be extremely short. It's not it's questions, it's not a long comment. So who would like to uh, ask a question uh, to Mr. Babajan? Uh, Mr. Herr Jankovic from Austria. By the way, when we had the WPC in Austria in 2000, 14, uh, President Gül was the guest of honor of the World Policy Conference. So we have a, a long, uh, when I say we, I mean WPC has a long story of friendship with Turkey and we want to keep it alive. There's no doubt about that and we have wonderful memories of, uh, of uh, President Gül um, um, uh, in Vienna. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Barbakan, um, amongst the many uh, problems uh, facing the world, uh, not only Turkey, uh, are minority problems. And there are many countries that have uh, rather bigger or smaller minorities. And in Turkey, of course, uh, we have uh, the Kurdish problem. And you should be sure that nobody in Europe has the slightest sympathy for terrorist methods as they are applied by the PKK and similar groups. On the other hand, there will be a need uh, to come to some kind of compromise, to some kind of arrangement uh, but there is a large group, which is not only uh, present in Turkey, also in, in Iraq and in Iran. So um, your strategy in that regard uh, would be of great interest to us. Thank you. Well, uh, actually, uh, we don't really have a Kurdish problem in Turkey. It's a PKK terrorist problem that we are going through in Turkey. Why? Because, first of all, the ruling party, AK Party, my party, is the party which gets the highest amount of support from the Kurdish citizens of Turkey. So we are, we are the number one party as the ruling party, which gets the highest amount of support to the Kurdish population of Turkey. Plus, when we look just across the border in Iraq, uh, Turkey and the KRG has now very good relations. And probably right now, Erbil-Ankara relations are better than Badak-Ankara relations nowadays. So I wouldn't call it a Kurdish problem. It's a terrorism problem. And we cannot label the terrorism problem by any ethnicity, by any religion or religious sect. And PKK is a terrorist organization, which is officially recognized by EU, by US, and by other individual countries and, and, and uh, other international organizations. So, and how to deal with it? Uh, yes, we do need a comprehensive approach when we deal with terrorists, but the thing was, when we actually had the, the dialogue process uh, to solve this terror issue, then uh, PKK's Syrian arm, PYD, YPG, they became an operational partner to the United States in fight against Daesh. So this gave PKK another wave of encouragement or a new source of legitimacy to resort back to terror in Turkey. So that's, that's very problematic. So when we talk about terror or terrorist organizations, we have to have a, a categorical approach and we should not use one terrorist organization and not against another terrorist organization. We should not cooperate with terrorist organizations. Dialogue. Maybe a uh, comprehensive approach, yes, but don't cooperate with them. Don't take them as partners in any kind of business that you are, you are doing with. So, uh, so this is what we went through, and PKK increased its uh, terrorist acts within uh, Turkey, especially last, more than last one year now, it cost us uh, hundreds and hundreds of civilian lives, as well as uh, official, uh, officials' lives. Uh, so it is a regional issue now, and, and it, it does need an international approach. So no country alone nowadays can deal with any terror organization alone. Because terror organizations are now cross-border. It is intranational. It is international. Uh, so uh, we need to see that uh, this also needs an international cooperation. So no country should feel lonely when it is time to fight against terror organizations. 
Uh, and we are kind of feeling lonely in our fight against PKK nowadays. Uh, they are their operation partner uh, with the US and they have their activities in many, many countries in the European Union. They are approached with sympathy, empathy, depends on the, on the, on the country. And, and uh, I think solidarity is uh, very important here and we need to have uh, a, a stronger cooperation, collaboration uh, when we talk about uh, terror uh, nowadays. And un unless we do this, uh, it is very easy. And one, one organization that you cooperate today could be an enemy for you uh, following months or, 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 or years. So, uh, and, and, and I, I think also we have done a lot in terms of making Turkey uh, a country where uh, differences can live together in peace. And our history, actually, when we look at this region overall, and when we look at Turkey, many, many cities are multicultural cities, multi-ethnical cities, multi-religious cities. Uh, and it's very important to preserve this uh, aspect of uh, diversity, uh, city by city, country by uh, country, and having values and ideals which are above ethnicity, which, which are above any, uh, any religious sect or something, or something like that, is, is something that we need to go through. So uh, we are going to have, I think, tomorrow, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, a session on terrorism. But one of the big problems, of course, is that there is no universally agreed definition of terrorism. Even in the UN system, they have never agreed on a definition of terrorism. And we know a number of former, of people once considered to be terrorists who received the Nobel Prize for Peace. Uh, so it's a, it's a quite a, a complex uh, a situation, and, uh, 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 but uh, I will give the floor to Mr. Lai Shubi for short, but short intervention, and unfortunately, and then uh, we will have to perhaps time for one more question. S'il te plaît, brièvement, parce qu'il faut être très très succinct là. Merci. L'Algérie a une présence très forte et continue dans les institutions africaines. Et elle a régulièrement fait le... L'Algérie a une présence... Euh, bon, Laïchoubi, ancien ministre euh, algérien académicien. L'Algérie a une très forte présence dans les institutions africaines et elle a souvent choisi le choix de la résolution des conflits et des crises par l'approche politique, que ce soit en Somalie, que ce soit en Érythrée, que ce soit en Libye et, 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 et ailleurs. Je voudrais avoir votre avis à ce titre. Comment voyez-vous le dossier libyen Quelle est votre approche Et également, quelle est votre approche de l'Afrique du Nord, d'une manière générale, et, et de l'Afrique Et je vous remercie. Uh. I'm afraid I was able to catch the translation only in the middle. If you'd like to uh, summarize the question. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, actually what I, I, I said for, uh, for, for Middle East uh, in terms of coexisting, in terms of having the, the multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious societies is very much valid for, for North Africa as well. You, you mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, Libya. Well, we have relatively more successful examples, but also worse examples. Well, starting from Egypt, unfortunately, there was a military coup, and an and elected president is now in jail, and uh, there, is a, there is a different kind of an administration right now in, in, in Egypt. And when we look at uh, Tunisia, maybe it's a more successful example, having a, a good transformation still with issues, but still a better example. Uh, but in case of Libya, it's very unfortunate because of the very divided nature of the, uh, of the society and also very divided nature of, of politics, different powers acting with each other. Uh, but I think uh, in the international community, the, 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 the UN, has played a very constructive role for Libya. And, and uh, the, the, the political agreement, the Libya political agreement, which all the uh, many countries, the international community has agreed on, 
uh, it has to function uh, more and more. And we have to side with the, the, the legitimate, when I say legitimate, when the, the, whatever the international community has agreed on, the structures, the new uh, councils, the new administrative structure, uh, needs to be supported more and more by the, the international community. And also, uh, Daesh, unfortunately, in Libya, is a, 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 a still a player over there. Uh, hopefully, we will see a phasing out of, of Daesh. But when we look at the root causes of many of these terror organizations, like Daesh, we also uh, see alienation. Uh, we see exclusion. We see oppression. Uh, so no group, no sect, no ethnicity should have any kind of dominance over the others. We should uh, target for uh, governance in, uh, in countries which truly reflects the composition of the society so that the will and the aspirations of the people will be reflected in how the countries uh, will be governed. And external support is very, very important because sometimes just the domestic uh, dynamics of a country will not allow a successful solution. Uh, I think that's, it's, a, it's a big, big duty, I think, for European Union uh, and countries like, like, like US and, and, and others uh, to consult more and also have a more of a unified approach. And if every country looks from its national perspective and national interest perspective uh, to Libya or other uh, countries in, in North Africa, uh, I, I don't think that will be a, a healthy solution uh, anytime soon. So, so I think it's a very, very big duty for the European Union and the US just stripping off from the national interests for a while and coming together and what is the best for Libya and other countries, not what is the best for people of uh, Libya. Because at the end of the day, if there is a lack of stability, if there are security issues, uh, this will hit the neighborhood. Sometimes it is in the form of refugees, uh, like we are observing uh, Syria or other North African uh, Syria or North African countries. Many, many refugees are trying to uh, reach Europe and causing uh, huge social and economic issues. Or terrorism. I think the, the, the most immediate spillover effect of difficulties in those, on those countries are refugees and terrorism. And no country is immune. So uh, it, need, it does need a lot of uh, communication, cooperation, collaboration, uh, when it comes to have uh, solutions. And the solutions at the end of the day need to be political solutions. Uh, the, the, the military solutions alone, if it is just a military perspective, uh, is not long lasting, it's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, a, a sustainable solution uh, most of the time. Uh, and for Libya and for other countries, having good political targets and uh, international community working together very closely uh, with is supranational values and ideals rather than uh, narrow national interests. I think that is going to be important. Thank you. Unfortunately, time is running out, so we will take one last question that will be Dorothe Schmidt, and then we have to stop, unfortunately. Uh, um, my name is Dorothe Schmidt. I'm following Turkey at uh, IFRI. Uh, my question would be, how do you assess the cost of the coup, the economic cost of the coup? How does it affect the stability of the Turkish state especially vis-a-vis -vis some areas such as the judiciary I'm particularly interested in. And you think there's a chance that death penalty would be voted back into the Turkish law, and for what purpose? Well, uh, uh, unfortunately, the Gülenists, uh, the followers of, 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 of Gülen, infiltrated many state units, but especially judiciary, in terms of judges and prosecutors, were one of their most important targets. And we are estimating that about 30 to 40 percent of the judges and prosecutors were under the direct influence of the organization. And now we are trying to solve the problem through, again, our own judicial system. So yes, many judges and prosecutors were laid off because of the fact that when it is time to decide, we are not sure if they are going to decide by the Constitution, by the law, and by their conscience, or are they going to decide by the orders that they get from Pennsylvania. We, we, we cannot be sure. 
So in order to make sure that the judges and prosecutors really do the job that they are supposed to do, we have to be sure that they are able to act uh, independently and they are able to act without any uh, influence from here and there. Uh, and they should also feel empowered to do the right things. So thinking about the judicial system, which is 30 to 40 percent under the influence, and stripping off these people from the system and dealing with the problem with the rest of the judges and prosecutors, it's not an easy process. So we have been hiring many new judges and prosecutors, young uh, lawyers, which are now being trained and put into the system. But it's going to take time, and this is not going to be flawless. Uh, so, but, but it's a big effort, a massive, massive effort right now uh, going on to go uh, back to normal with our judicial system, to go back to normal with our, uh, our, our security uh, units. Uh, the death penalty, yes, it is now in the agenda of the country, uh, but no uh, proposal has come yet to the parliament, uh, and we don't know about what kind of a proposal it will be, if it will be or not, the timing. Those are all unknown, but, but it is now in the public domain, it, and it is now uh, in the agenda. But nothing concrete about how it will, uh, it will progress uh, from now on. We will see. It. But it, it will be a democratic procedure that uh, we will follow. We know how it is uh, and, and, and uh, how important of a subject it is, uh, not only for our European uh, Union uh, friends, uh, it is also important, very important for our own country and also our own uh, citizens. Uh, but you have to remember that we went uh, through a big trauma, a coup attempt, and this was just four months ago, not uh, decades ago, and it's very fresh, and the influence of this on our public is still huge. Uh, and, and, and we have to see how things will evolve. Well, unfortunately, we have to stop here. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank you again also, Mr. Davutoglu, for his interve intervention this morning. Turkey is a very important country for the international system overall, uh, particularly, of course, in the, the European continent, in the Middle East. And uh, I very much hope that next year, the next uh, WPC, we will have also, we could spend more time perhaps uh, to uh, talk with uh, uh, our uh, Turkish uh, friends. And I hope that the global situation will have improved by then. So thank you very much again. Please don't leave the room. Well, you're, you're, you're going to applaud him in a second, but don't leave the room because each time we are losing 10 minutes and that put the, the, the schedule uh, 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 and also I would like to remind you that there is a studio WPC TV uh, room number six outside and uh, our journalists would like to interview uh, many of you so they will probably get in touch with you so thank you very much uh, Ali and now we applaud you and I ask for the next uh, panelist to come immediately uh, on stage